how did I come upon learning about Bud Fowler? And it's kind of interesting. So not a kind of, but it, it's another slide here. So back 40 years ago, yes, 40 years ago, and I was entering college. I was a freshman down at Mankato State University. And I was registering for classes. And I thought, well, I'm going to ease myself into this and take you know, basket weaving number one and, you know, bowling. And so I thought I'd also take, uh, I saw this thing, it said history of sports. And it was taught by Professor John DeMiglio. And the history of sports, I've, you know, I come from Stillwater High School. We had a large class, but I never had a class in an auditorium. So this class that I had was uh, about 150 to 200 students and uh, taking notes like crazy. This is one of the toughest classes I thought I ever had, but uh, it was John DeMiglio who uh, was talking about early uh, black baseball before the color line. And he was talking about Saul White, uh, you know, Stovey, all these other guys. And all of a sudden he talked about this Bud Fowler. So I'm taking notes. And he said, well, Bud Fowler played in Minnesota and I'm taking notes. And he said he played in Stillwater, Minnesota in 1884. I go, what? You know, I thought I uh, knew Stillwater history. I'm, I'm several generations in Stillwater and I never heard that Stillwater had a, base, a professional baseball club. So not only did Bud Fowler interest me, but they, the team itself interests me. And so I ran down the uh, to uh, talk to the professor and he told me that there wasn't a whole lot of information about Bud Fowler at that time. That was 40 years ago. So I should start, the, you know, go to the library on campus, see what I can find, and then uh, go from there, see what else is out there. Well, that got me onto a mission that I'm still working on today. I finally, <laughs> finally got uh, some of my stuff organized just for this uh, presentation. It was in different drawers in my house. There were some down in my office. There were books everywhere. Um, I, I finally got used this event tonight to organize myself. So, but one thing that we have to look at is Stillwater had a professional baseball team. How did Stillwater become a baseball town? Yes, Stillwater is a baseball town. So let's move on to see about that. Now there's a really great researcher on early Minnesota baseball. His name is Rich Arpey. Now, oh, he's over there. Hi, Rich. <laughs> now, as we were going through, uh, Stillwater, he was going through 1860s Minnesota baseball and Stillwater was prominent with a, uh, a baseball club. And Rich told me that he found a little notation, 1859 newspaper that the St. Paul club was coming to Stillwater to play. It didn't say who was gonna play, it didn't say when they were gonna play, and even the next paper didn't even mention the, about the game. We, so we don't know if there was a game or not, but it did mention St. Paul coming to Stillwater to play baseball in 1859. So we could kind of trace back the start right around that area, just after Minnesota became a state. 1860, about the same thing. There was a little notation here and there about St. Paul going to Stillwater, Stillwater going to St. Paul. And then in 1861, there was this, um, this incident that happened and it lasted for, uh, uh, until 1865. Kind of uh, wiped out baseball in the state, but it did help spread baseball throughout different uh, parts of uh, the country during the Civil War. 1866, Stillwater did start a team, we know that. In 1867, the team was known as the St. Croix Baseball Club. They got a name and they started playing games and they were, uh, they were mentioned in the Stillwater Messenger. Uh, and so Stillwater was getting more and more into baseball. In 1868, Stillwater had a good team. They actually won the state championship. And back at that time, the state championship, you had to, uh, uh, to uh, go after the, uh, the certain champions and they played two out of three games, one at home, one away, and then one at a neutral site. And the, and the team that won two out of three became the state champions. 
St. Croix Baseball Club became state champions after they beat Northfield two out of three, and they won the silver ball. That's, uh, that was kind of the trophy for the state champion. Well, the St. Croix got to keep that trophy over the winter, but then they lost it to Lake City in uh, 1869. But, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Nobody but, knows where the silver, the silver ball is. But didn't, Rich, didn't you say that there was like two or three or four silver balls actually made? Oh, probably. I imagine that it might have been made for every championship. But, uh, it could be. I, but I, I've never, I've seen one silver ball online that went, uh, it had a lot of dings in it, but it was a Minnesota state champion, it said. It, a lot of it was uh, all rubbed out, but uh, never did get that one. I don't know where it went. Over 2,000, so it would have been nice to have that. But the St. Croix Baseball Club continued to play. I mean, uh, St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis, they had teams that would we would uh, they would come around. But one of the highlights of Stillwater baseball, I hate to say that because I'm talking about 1876, <laughs> is on. October 19th, 1876, the St. Croix Baseball Club took on the National League champions, <laughs> Chicago White Stockings. Now, after the, that, in 1876 was the first year for the National League. And the White Stockings came and played. They did a barnstorming tour after the season. And they stopped in Stillwater. And... Um, and they also stopped in St. Paul, Minneapolis. On the St. Croix, they had some of their best players. Well, whatever. <laughs> uh, W.E. Easton, William Easton, known as Willie Easton. Easton, by the way, at this time, 1876, he was still working for his father, who was the editor and owner of the Stillwater Gazette. Fred Pennington, Thomas Birmingham, McCusick. And there was another attorney that was on the, on the team named Charles Gregory. On the board of directors of the St. Croix in 1876 was Fayette Marsh, Sam Keeley, W.E. Easton was on the board, and one of the directors also was a man named Joel May, and you'll hear these names later on. Well, how do you think the game went <laughs> between the, between the uh, Chicago champions and the St. Croix baseball club? <laughs> well, you know, it went just about as but as you thought. The uh, St. Croix were defeated 18 to 3, but it certainly opened the door for more excitement about the sport later on. And during the season, and as I mentioned, they played teams from uh, the St. Croix played teams from Winona, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and the Minneapolis Blue Stockings in 1876. They had uh, an, a player that would come and play, his name was Joe Visner. Again, a name that you'll hear down the road. So 1876, even though they were beaten, it made a lot of excitement uh, throughout the community. Raleigh. The White Sox, I assume, were professional. Yes. Yeah. No, the St. Croix was all amateur. And on the uh, St. Croix, I mean, on the, uh, the National League, the, the, that team, you probably heard the names Cap Anson. Uh, you heard, uh, you know, Spalding, uh, Andres. Uh, there was a shortstop named Johnny Peters as well. So keep some of those names in mind as we go through this. So a lot of excitement. A lot of people want to play baseball in Stillwater at that time because it was just going on. And then there was a team that was formed called the Minnesota Chiefs. Now, the Minnesota Chiefs, they're named after the Minnesota Chiefs threshing machine. On the north end of town, there was the Seymour Sabin Company. The Seymour Sabin Company had the, the contract for prison labor and they made farm implements, they made steam engines, they did all sorts of things. And the Minnesota Chief was their uh, best-selling thresher and they could undercut, it would cost any other company. And that's why it was so popular. So the Minnesota Chiefs uh, sponsored this team and in, from 1880 to 1883. And in the 1883 team, boy, was that a good team, or so they thought. There was a lot of excitement. You can see this roster up there. 
hey, there's Thomas Birmingham again, Burlington. There's uh, the McCarthy's. There's James uh, Messenger from Menominee. Uh, Gordon Whit Whiteley from Providence, Rhode Island. Now, Gordon Whiteley ended up playing two years in the major leagues. Carr and Javine from Chicago, they played with, together in, uh, after 1883 in Chicago, and then they played together again in Buffalo in 1886. So you can see some of the, where they got the, some of the players for 1883 out of Chicago, Menominee, Wisconsin, and also out of Rhode Island. Rhode Island, I know Providence, Grays, yes, and all that, but you wouldn't think Rhode Island was a big uh, baseball state, but it was. It's amazing. So, 18, so 1883 finished, and it was a great, great time, and everyone is really thinking about going to the next level. But can Stillwater actually go to the next level? That's what always interests me. Stillwater was a lumber town. There was a lot of money floating, floating down the St. Croix River. You know, you have oil in Texas, you have oil out in California, but you had lumber here in Stillwater and in Minnesota. That is where all the money was. Also in Stillwater at the time was the Minnesota State Prison. There was a, there were convicts. Uh, you probably heard of the Younger Brothers. They rode in a gang with Frank and Jesse James. They tried to rob the bank down in Northfield and it was a colossal disaster. The James brothers got away, but the Younger Brothers were captured and they were sentenced to life in prison at the Stillwater prison. In 1884, in January, the prison caught fire. I know I get excited about things, excuse me. <laughs> fire, yes, he gets excited about fires. But uh, the fire ended up going into the cell blocks and the Younger Brothers, along with some others, were given weapons to help guard some of the prisoners out of the prison and across the street. Cole Younger, the oldest, was given a revolver. His brother Jim, a knife, and uh, his other brother Bob, uh, an iron bar. They escorted the female convicts out and then they handed their weapons back in. They could have easily escaped. And there was a lot of talk about in the newspapers that it was a planned fire to rescue or how the uh, younger brothers escaped, but it was not true. So Stillwater, the population of Stillwater itself, according to the city directory, wait a minute. Stillwater city directory, it has uh, 13,698 people. But if you add South Stillwater, which we know is Bayport and Oak Park, which is now Oak Park Heights, the population soars <laughs> to over 15,000 people. Well, they thought with all this money, with all these people, let's do this. Let's get into a professional baseball team. We can do this, can they? So getting into the Northwestern League, how does, a, how does an idea of an amateur team get into a professional league? Well, first you've got to start with an association or a company. You've got to have this, uh, the Stillwater Baseball Association. And that's what they did. And I found the actual pages at the Secretary of State's office that shows all the, the people who have signed it, how much uh, stock they're going to produce, that type of thing. So they were serious. In October, on October 10th, at the Sawyer House, which is a large hotel in Stillwater where the Lowell Inn is right now, they organized a stock company. And this meeting of people came, and it was decided to have Charles Gregory to be appointed to preside over the meeting. Others at the meeting were uh, Seward Richardson, Willie Easton, Dudley Hersey, and of course, another McCusick. The Stillwater Baseball Association was formed, uh, formed at $10,000 in, in stock. The Sporting Life newspaper, which I'll talk about, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but the Sporting Life newspaper, a national sporting newspaper, mentioned that meeting in October of 1883 and noted that it called Stillwater, quote, a plucky little town for raising $10,300 towards supporting a new club in just three hours 
and a half. Not that's pretty good for back at that time. And I could uh, go into all the meetings in which Gregory and the directors of this new baseball association, they went to Chicago, they uh, pleaded their case back and forth because the Northwestern League was a set league from 1883, but they expanded from 1883 when they had six teams to 1884 when they had 12 teams. And one of those new 12 teams, one of those new teams was Stillwater, Minnesota. So Stillwater got in. <laughs> Stillwater, however, was the smallest city in population of all 12 clubs. Milwaukee, by the way, was the largest. And if you want to see where all of the, uh, the teams came from, here are the Northwestern League cities of 1884. Stillwater, St. Paul, and Minneapolis out of Minnesota. We have Peoria and Quincy in Illinois, Terre Haute and Fort Wayne in Indiana, Grand Rapids, Muskegon, and Saginaw Bay City out of Michigan, and Milwaukee in Wisconsin. Thankfully, we only had one Wisconsin team. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Before I, I have not got to follow her yet because we need to uh, get this foundation on how the team got to be and who runs this team. So the directors are Charles Perry Gregory. He was an attorney. There was William Conrad. He was the, he owned a tobacco business. Conrad is kind of interesting because Conrad came to Stillwater in 1865. He, he teamed up right then with AC Hospice in 1865 and they went to, uh, together in a business, uh, tobacco business. Why I say it's interesting is because AC Hospice was a member of the first Minnesota Company B during the Civil War. And Conrad was with a Virginia regiment and he was a Confederate. <laughs> but I guess the partnership made and they did pretty, they did well. pretty well. There was uh, George Brown, who was the county treasurer at the time. There was Dudley Hersey and Seward Richardson. However, George Brown did resign and Frank Joy was put in his place. So by January 30th, the, uh, the directors led by uh, Gregory had started contacting uh, baseball players, players to fill the field for that day. In January 30th, they had the secured Edgar Chapman, C.D. Gibbs, James McCusick, McKendrick, excuse me, Yarnell, uh, Harry Yarnell, John J. Horan, Frank M. Jones, and John W. Fowler. Now, how did Gregory get the names of these players? It's kind of unusual, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, he got the name of Fowler. And I'm pretty sure at that point he knew Fowler was black, but he, had, he signed them and he had, didn't talk to the rest of the board of directors. In the Stillwater Messenger on March 22nd, it, it says that quote, Mr. Fowler's recommendations are of, the, are, the, are of the best. And though there was at first considerable objection to employing him on the part of prominent members of the club, all objection has disappeared and he will be respected in proportion to his skill as a player. Now that was published in the newspaper. Do you really think all objections uh, disappeared? <laughs> Not sure about that. But those are the uh, baseball uh, directors. Those are the ones who are in charge of the team. Now let's see the people that, that those directors put in charge of the uh, team on the field, the uh, club managers. Now the club managers, these would lead the players on the field. And as you can tell, over the course of the season, there were four different managers, Joel May, uh -huh. We, we hear about Joel May as a director of the St. Croix Baseball Club. And Joel May, his, rec, his uh, resume was that he was enthusiastic about baseball. Well, look at his uh, record was 0-6, and then he hightailed it out of there. After, after May, there was a man named Joseph Miller. He was, quote, unquote, an old-time man who was living in White Bear at the time. He had played two years prior to uh, the National League, the National Association, and uh, he played for Washington, 
Chicago and a town in Iowa called Keokuk, which will also come back. After Miller left, Fred Gunkel came in. Now Fred, he played one game for Cleveland in 1879. And he was the umpire in the Northwestern League in 1884 until he was fired. I found a couple, uh, couple games that were challenged because Gunkel just didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> so he left and then ended up as Stillwater's uh, manager. So mm, maybe not a good thing. Hey, he's got the... yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seven and seven, not bad. And then the final one who uh, I think was uh, probably the best player was um, Johnny Peters. We heard about Johnny Peters before, right? He played for the Chicago White Stockings when they came to Stillwater in 1876. So now Johnny Peters is back managing the Stillwater Club. And he had 11 years in, in the major leagues with the Chicago White Stockings. He also played for Providence, Buffalo, and Pittsburgh. And I have actually, when I was uh, Googling Johnny Peters, we didn't have Google 40 years ago, so. <laughs> but uh, there are some people who in the uh, yeah, yeah, football yeah. committee who think that Johnny Peters should be considered, I didn't say should be, but might be considered for the Hall of Fame. So now we have the directors. They've uh, hired some players. They got the managers on the field. Now let's talk about the players. Well, the players. This is the list that was in the Stillwater Gazette and the original members of the club. Some of these players never step, step foot on the field to play for the team, such as John Irwin or John Trapley. I don't think uh, they played uh, in an inning for the team. And also McKendrick did not play. But this was the first uh, look at the players. They play, the players, as you can tell, were from all over. And they were from Chicago. They were from Rhode Island again. And uh, they only found one from Minnesota. <laughs> only one, they only signed one player from Minnesota, Joe Visner. <laughs> he was from Minneapolis. Well, he's, he played him from Minneapolis, but he was from up north. His actual name was Benzina. Is that, am I pronouncing that right, Bob? Benzina? Yeah, but he wasn't from up north. Well, that's where he's, that's where he is now. Yeah, well. That was a long time. Right? <laughs> yes, but uh, he, was he was okay. So he was the only one from Minnesota that was on Stillwater's team. Now, the Daily Sun newspaper, Stillwater, quite a few newspapers, and we'll get into that little discussion later. But the Stillwater Daily Sun noted that the salaries for the Stillwater Club seemed to average as low as any in the league. And uh, the, the average was about a thousand per, per man. And it was also noted that John J. Horan received a salary of $1,200 and a $200 bonus. The Stillwater Gazette, uh, when, when introducing the player, players noted, it's either play or take a walk. The starting members of the club would change over and over again. It would be only Fowler, Visner, and another player you don't see on the list here, but John Pickett who would play the entire season for Stillwater. So we have all that. And now let's talk about Bud Fowler. Fowler was born up in Fort Plain, New York in 1858. He was born as John W. Jackson, Jr. You can see that uh, the dark area here is an 1860 uh, census records from Cooperstown because in 1860, by the time he was two, the family had moved to Cooperstown, New York. Does anyone know what else is in Cooperstown, New York? Hmm. Exactly. The Corvette Museum? I like the golf course. The source of the Susquehanna River. Susquehanna? Yeah, it's a beautiful lake. Yeah, it's yeah. Within a block of the hall of fame. Uh, the lake is called Onita. What is that? A seagull. A seagull. So now that everybody knows about Cooperstown, you've got to go and visit. <laughs> now, uh, as he started playing baseball, he took the name John, he took the name Fowler. I'm not exactly sure. I haven't found out why. And uh, his nickname, Bud, was given to him because he would actually 
<laughs> he'd be calling people bud all the time and so that that nickname kind of came back to him so he became known as bud fowler according to what i've read at the baseball hall of fame that he became the first professional black baseball player when he pitched for chelsea massachusetts in april of 1878 and also supposedly on april 24th 1878 he pitched an exhibition game victory over the Boston League Club. And in May, he pitched for pitched three games for the Live Oaks in, in Massachusetts. That is where he got his start. That is what is uh, known as him becoming the first professional baseball play, black baseball player in history. Now, I, I didn't say major league black baseball player, I said professional. So I wanna make sure we get clear that up. Now for the next few years, he'd play wherever he could but he finally landed at the Stillwater Club. And when he played for the Stillwater Club, it gave him national exposure like he's never had before. I'm adjusting the lights so that we go on Zoom, so oh. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> so, where am I? Ah, okay, next, next slide. I gotta look at some of this stuff. Fowler came in, er in middle of March, to Stillwater in 1884. He uh, obviously had to have a place to stay. So there was a boarding house in Stillwater that was called Live and Let Live. Kind of a, kind of a motto probably for his life. As you see, he's in the Stillwater City Directory of 1884. You wanna take a look, it's right here. And uh, the boarding house was owned by a man named William Humphreys. Now Humphreys was also black. So I think a lot of the discussion uh, with the directors said uh, and eased the mind of everybody was because there was a boarding house in Stillwater owned by a black family. So Fowler could live there. Fowler would also later on be introduced to a man named Sam Hadley. Sam Hadley was a barber, a black barber in town and Fowler was also trained as a barber. His father was a barber. So Fowler would uh, work at Sam Hadley's barbershop on occasions when he wasn't playing. Now, the team is all ready. The team has come, it's April. They're getting, getting to, ready to go. And so the 1884 season begins. The Northwestern League, as I mentioned, had 12 teams. The, at that time, the Stillwater, uh, I mean, uh, what was I gonna say? This, there's gonna be 110 games per, for the season, excuse me. 55 away, 55 at home. Stillwater had a problem though. Their stadium or their field did not meet league standards. So they had to upgrade and they had to upgrade a lot. So Stillwater would play their first 27 games on the road. <laughs> now, they were able to do uh, a few other things. They were able to uh, have some pre-season uh, pre games, exhibition games. They played an exhibition game in, uh, in St. Paul on April 26. The Stillwater Club beat St. Paul 12 to six. Fowler was playing left field and he went two for five and scored two runs. This, of course, made everybody in Stillwater very happy. I should also mention that in 1884, the Northwestern League accepted the league rules. And there's some differences from the league rules of 1884 to what there is now. The pitcher's point, where the uh, pitcher would throw the ball from was not 60 feet, six inches. It was 50 feet. Ooh. <laughs> the home grounds, as I mentioned before, needed to be have an enclosed field. And three strikes and you're out, and seven balls, you get a walk. So yeah, seven, you get seven balls, and then you get the walk. The uh, baseball that they would use, and I just uh, confirmed this with the ball guru from Rochester, Corky. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, when we play vintage baseball around here, we what, what is what we call a lemon peel ball. I don't know, kind of like a 
bloom ball, I don't know what they called it back then. And it looks like this. But in, uh, by 1872, they had a figure eight type of a baseball and they were using this type of baseball in 1884. You <laughs> Our new recruit, by the way. Right. Uh, there you go. So Stillwater had to play on the road, and their first uh, first groups of uh, games were going to be down in Peoria, Illinois. But on the way down there, why not hit up a couple uh, another city and play some exhibitions? So Stillwater played two more exhibitions on the way to Peoria. They played against Rock Island. They lost the first game, fifteen to nine. Fowler had one hit and one run scored. The following match had Stillwater winning again, 14 to four with Fowler having three hits, two more runs scored. The Rock Island Argus newspaper noted the Stillwater Baseball Club, Negro and all, <laughs> departed for Peoria on the Rock Island Peoria Road where they will cross batch with the Peoria Reds. Now there was some good hype. Stillwater was, you know, they, they didn't know what Stillwater was gonna be. I mean. Stillwater came in really late, had to pick up the leftovers of these players, but still, people still thought Stillwater wasn't going to be very good. But the Grand Rapids Time, Grand Rapids Times in late uh, April noted that, quote, the Stillwater Club is laying about as dormant as a sun basking alligator. <laughs> they may astonish the natives, though, when they wake up. So there was at least somebody out there thinking that, hey, Stillwater might be pretty good. So off they go. They start the season. 27 games on the road with Bud Fowler and, a, and, a, and all these other players. Remember, players coming in and going. So all I have to say for my next talk is the streak. And I don't mean someone walking, running across the field naked. And when I talk about the streak, it's not very good. So it's, they started their uh, season in Peoria. They played their first um, game and Stillwater loses 15 to nothing. But Fowler didn't play in that game for some reason. Stillwater had 17 errors. The pitcher was Harry Yarnell. The second game, Stillwater lost again, eight to 12. Fowler this time played center field and catcher and he went two for five scored a run, and he hit a triple. The, PR, the Peoria transcript said Fowler, a gentleman of color, who did good work, is he is one of the best players on the club. Still would have lost the third game in a row, one and nothing. And the lone run scoring on a drop fly ball in the first inning. Well, all right, so they lost three games. So, okay, we, they can come back from that, can't they? Come on. <laughs> Well, they went on to play Quincy and they lost three more. And uh, they lost uh, one of the games was 16 to nothing. The battery in that match was a new pitcher that they had signed called, his name was MJ Bradley, uh, pitching and Fowler was catching. At that game, Fowler was also spiked in the foot. Yeah. The next set of games was in Milwaukee. Again, losing all three of them. Fowler was right back in the lineup after being spiked, though. But the uh, Daily Globe noted that Fowler, the colored second baseman of the Stillwaters, was an object of great interest. And his fine fielding and swift running elicited many favorable comments. He injured his finger badly in a plucky attempt to stop a grounder from Griffin's bat in the ninth inning. But he'll be able to play on Monday. The second game, uh, Bradley pitched again and lost 14 to 4. After that, he was released. <laughs> The last game with the Milwaukee's still order lost seven, uh, 15 to seven. So now what do we got? Three, six, nine losses in a row. Starting to sound like the Baltimore Orioles back in the eighties there were these. Oh, oh. The first manager's already left. Oh yeah, the first manager already, zero and six. he was zero and six. <laughs> so now we're on, on to the next one who is uh, still repeating the same mistakes, I guess. Well, we're gonna go to, Still want to go to Bay City, Michigan now. This is going to be where we're going to get, get back on track, right? Well, the first game, our hopes were dashed. Lost 21 to 9. Still are committing 16 errors. 
The second game saw uh, Fowler pitching for the first time. The Stillwater Gazette noted that Fowler, the colored general player for the Stillwater Club, kept the boys guessing up until the sixth inning while pitching at Bay City. The Bay City team won four to nothing. And the final game, Stillwater lost again, 12 to one. This is becoming a very, very, very bad streak. And as you can imagine, Stillwater is in the basement of the Northwestern League. They are the worst team in the North of the 12 teams. They are number 12. Imagine that. I can't imagine that. Well, now we're going to go. Stillwater's going to go to Saginaw, Michigan next. And Stillwater, uh, in that first game against Saginaw, they were making a comeback. They were losing uh, six to two, six to three. But in the final inning, they scored one more run and they lost six to five. <laughs> The next game they lost, yes, nine to six. And the final match of the series, Stillwater again lost eight to two. Now, 12 in a row, I mean, 15 in a row. This is getting kind of silly. So now they're off to Fort Wayne. The first match was just like the previous 15. Here we go again. Stillwater lost 12 to six. The Fort Wayne Gazette noted, the Stillwaters work together harmoniously, play ball to win, and why they stand at the bottom of the league race is one of the mysteries of ball playing. A number of their defeats have been by the closest scores possible and more attributed to bad luck than bad playing. 16 losses in a row. I know. I don't know, but 16 losses in a row. Fowler played 13 of the 16 games. He had 51 at bats. He scored five runs, had 10 hits, but he batted only 196. So that wasn't all that good. So why is Fowler? We, why do we think Fowler is so good? Well, just that wait. Been high for the team, though, it probably team. was. Because <laughs> yeah. they scored so few runs. 16 in a row. That was enough. Finally, Stillwater gets its first win at Fort Wayne. Fowler was pitching again. The Fort Wayne Daily Journal noted Fowler, the color player, being in the box. His delivery is speedy, and the fact that Fort Wayne only got seven hits off him show, shows it was effective. Fowler would also receive a $10 bonus and a new suit of clothes for his pitching the team to their first win. Now, I should mention this earlier, but Rich, throw me a ball. <laughs> Yeah, close now. Now, before 1884, pitching was like sidearm, underhand. But in 1884 was the first year that you could throw and pitch overhand. So that became legal. So when, you, when you're talking about pitching, there were still a lot of players who would pitch sidearm, even in 1884, because they were used to it. So that's when, his, when they talk about speed delivery. Is not Mr. Rogers' key delivery. Um, <laughs> so the next game, the very next game, they still want to put Fowler back in the box. He was pitching again, and they won again, eight to five, two in a row. And so they won two out of three at Fort Wayne. Now they move on to and they travel to Terre Haute, Indiana, for three more games. Fowler again pitching the third straight game, and again he won eleven to eight. So, hey, we got to come back here. The next game, Fowler played second base, going two for five with a double and Stillwater winning again, 11 to three. That's four in a row, people. <laughs> I, but, that, I know, it's, it's tough, it's tough. Take your shoes off, well, maybe not. Fowler pitched again in the next game, his fourth out of five games, and he won again. So Stillwater had, he won five to four against the Terre Haute. So Stillwater had five, has a five game winning streak, in which Fowler pitched and won four of the five. Just think of that. The Stillwater Daily Sun noted, Stillwater won games Thursday and Friday from Terre Haute boys. If the Stillwaters could only stay and play Terre Haute for a month, how happy we would be. <laughs> so the five game winning streak had Fowler batting, had 20 at bats, Five runs, eight hits, a 400 average. Fowler's coming, he's getting his groove back. So we finally got our first win. 
And with all of that, with winning four out of five games, he was getting noticed. Fowler was getting noticed. So here's a, a Grand Rapids Eagle advertisement for the upcoming games. At the bottom it says, see Fowler, the great colored pitcher. And the Stillwater Daily Sun called Fowler a great, uh, of the colored bonanza. The Quincy Whig said the playing of Fowler, the colored pitcher of the Stillwaters was one of the features of yesterday's game. After capturing two long flies in left field, he was placed in the box and at the commencement of the seventh and did some excellent pitching. His base throwing was also quick and accurate. He is one of the most handy men on the visiting nine. And Muskegon Daily Chronicle, Fowler, the phenomenal pitcher. He's a good one. But the one I liked the most was um, from the St. Paul Daily Globe. And the Daily Globe had a Stillwater news section. So there was actually a Daily Globe reporter in Stillwater reporting about all this. And after one of the games they played, it says Fowler, however, played right away from everybody else in both teams making a total of six bases and five chances offered and running the bases like grease lightning. He plays the ball as though he's really in love with the game. And though Ebony Hewitt is a prize of no small value. Jeez, you know, everybody's lavishing a lot of this uh, praise onto Fowler, but um, this might be a good time for me to talk about how Fowler was targeted by the other players. Uh, in May, Fowler broke one of his bone. It says broke a bone of one of his toes and is unable to un, will be unable to play for four weeks. Fowler, the lightning-colored catcher for the Stillwaters, had his foot spiked by a base runner at home plate, breaking the bone of his big toe. The surgeon says it will be several days before he can play again. But Fowler asserts positively that he will be behind the bat again on Sat on Saturday, <laughs> which he was. <laughs> And again, uh, what is it? The last half of the 10th inning, Fowler, the color man was struck by a pitch ball. He was unconscious for some time. It was feared that one of his ribs were broken, but the Stillwater manager informs us that he'll be able to play again next week. <laughs> Fowler, the color player of Stillwater team was a tough man. He had broke, uh, two uh, ribs broken last week in, at Muskegon, but only laid him by for two or three games. And Monday he pitched here against um, Minneapolis. So he was, he was getting thrown at, he was getting spiked. They were trying to do that. Now, I know this is disproven, but Fowler put wooden planks on his shins. He kind of helped invent shin guards yeah. because he was getting spiked so much. And then I was, uh, what else was he considered? Oh, there is some online, of course, you can't believe everything you read, or that he also helped to invent the feet first slide. So, but he was he was targeted. Don't don't get any just because he's talked about gloriously in the newspapers, he was targeted. But now Stillwater is finally coming home. But they still had a few more games to play on the road. Stillwater continued their long road trip in Muskegon. The first game had Fowler pitching again, okay? So now he's pitching five out of six games. But this time he lost six to three. The next game, Fowler started the game, but was started pitching for the game, but was replaced by another player named James McHugh. And the, class, and the club lost in 10 innings, eight to six. And the last game, the Stillwater Club uh, lost again, eight to seven. Was this gonna be another streak going the wrong way? Off to Grand Rapids, to play uh, one of the top teams in the league. This time a player that they had signed, his name was Bert Weasel, Bert Whistle, pitched and lost 11 to three Grand Rapids. And then probably the most surprising game of the entire season, Stillwater beat Grand Rapids three to one in the second game, but they lost the last game 18 to six. Now I didn't tell you this, but each team, each of the 12 teams had a color scheme. And Stillwater color scheme was blue. And the Grand Rapids Eagle noted that the suits worn by Stillwater are the prettiest yet seen in the city. <laughs> At least they did something right. The body is a fawn color with dark blue cap, belts, and hose, and a blue S adorns the left breast. 
So Stillwater's color was blue. Now it's time. Stillwater is finally coming home. This, the new stadium, the new grounds are all done. That is just meticulously done. It is wonderful. It's enclosed. And uh, well, let's see here what we can, what, we, what did they do to it? The new baseball grounds on 6th Avenue are nearing completion. The location is an excellent one. The grounds, except for in case of a very heavy rain, could not be better than they are. The field is perfectly smooth with a slight decline to the east. That's going towards the river, by the way. The grandstand, which will seat some 500 spectators and will be admirably fitted up with seats, is at the south side, giving an excellent view of the games. The whole grounds are enclosed by a tight board fence, some 10 feet high, which will give trouble to the kids getting over as no one else would be mean enough to try. The grounds, uh, it was, it's also went on to say the grounds enclosed are 450 by 400 feet. And he is a heavy batter who will be able to drive the ball outside the fence 350 feet away. Now, I'm not sure if that is center field down the, but center field 350 straight out, that would give you a home run over the fence. So where are we here? After the, after the road trip, Stillwater's record was six and 21. And guess what? They were not in last place. Last place was St. Paul. <laughs> yes. You know, no matter how bad they are, as long as we can beat St. Paul. Now the first game back was on uh, June 9th. They were playing Minneapolis. The game was documented really well in the Stillwater Gazette. And if, oh, let me go over here. If you want to see it, it, I've got the back issues right here. <laughs> but it was inning for inning for that home opener. They played Minneapolis and there was a big crowd. They said there was over a thousand people at the stadium while looking for this uh, game. However, Fowler was pitching, but he lost the game three to two. Uh, the Gazette kind of started, now all of a sudden, the newspapers are kind of going the other way with Fowler. The Stillwater Gazette said, there was a little too much funny work by Fowler, which if dispensed with, would prove a benefit to the club and give better satisfaction to the audience. Stillwater Club lost the next day at home to Minneapolis, eight to seven. But the final match had Fowler pitching again, and he beat the dudes of Minneapolis 10 to six. Stillwater played the next three games against St. Paul, this time losing the first two again and winning the final match 10 to six. Stillwater had been infusing their lineup with new players. Uh, towards the end of the road trip, they uh, received, a, they got a, uh, three new players from the Milwaukee Reserves. One was named Otto Schomburg. Another one was Patrick Dealer, Dealey. Uh, John Quinn came from Canada. Brown, Connors, and others would come and they would come and go with the team. And it got a little confusing with the box scores. The Stillwater Wood Club would win a few and lose a few at home. On June 26th, Stillwater beat St. Paul 11 to 7. This at this game, Fowler had two doubles and scored three times. The next game, Stillwater beat Milwaukee eight to four. The Milwaukee Sentinel said, defeated by the Stillwaters was sadly murmured by the baseball enthusiasts last evening. <laughs> so Stillwater had some hype still, but Stillwater is still losing. Stillwater Club and Bud Fowler, they needed something to jazz them up. They needed something to get them going. And it took going to Minneapolis to do it. On July 1st and July 2nd, Stillwater beat Minneapolis twice, both days, and both of them were extra inning games. It sent the city of Stillwater into a baseball frenzy. It really did. The first game went 12 innings. Quinn was the pitcher and gave up only one run. Stillwater scored in the 12th, and both runs were scored by Joe Visner, including him hitting a home run. The second game took 14 innings to decide, with Stillwater winning eight to seven. It had James McHugh pitching, 
Fowler played in this game and he went three for six with two doubles and two runs scored. And it was excitement, but they didn't realize it. Do you remember when the uh, Minnesota Twins won the pennant on the road and they, they came back and all of a sudden there was, they came back to the Metrodome and it was full of the fans cheering them on. Well, obviously Stillwater was happy. The team was happy that uh, they won, but according to the Sporting Life, two successive victories over Minneapolis, one a 12 inning and the other a 14 inning game, set the citizens of Stillwater wild and a procession with music and escorted to the hotel, which was the Sawyer House, where a banquet was spread. In both these games, Johnny Peters, the new captain and shortstop, played a great game and accepted all 24 chances at second base. Now that was excitement. It was really exciting. And the Stillwater team also was doing a lot of things internally, trying to keep their team together. And one of the things that happened with the Stillwater team was when they came home, there was this little boy. This little boy wanted to be with the baseball players. So what he would do is he'd be running back and forth, running errands, he'd shake balls. He would do all of these things. And he was just a little boy and uh, he was 12 years old. And the St. Paul Daily Globe noted this at one of the team meetings. On Saturday evening, the members of the Stillwater Baseball Club did a very credible action. A young lad named Sam Belial has been very active on the grounds and doing many small favors for the boys and saving them many steps. And under the leadership of Mr. Peters, they all chipped in and presented Sam with an entire outfit, top to toe, he coming out a regular dude. A better pleased or prouder young lad could not be found in the city on Saturday evening. He deserves what was given to him and he has been very attentive to his duties, but that renders all the thoughtfulness and kindness of the team no less than giving him a good outfit. So the team was also trying to build that camaraderie. And also uh, the, the notation there about the little lad came out in the Monday, uh, July 7th newspaper. Well, also Stillwater would play a lot of exhibition games when they could. And the Winona Minnesota club came up here and played an exhibition. And Stillwater beat them eight to two. They usually played their exhibitions in Wiper Lake. But that would uh, that'd be kind of interesting down the road here in just a minute. Well, things uh, were getting kind of hot. You know, things were good and bad. But one of the teams that people didn't like was Bay City. And there was a quote unquote rumpus at the Sawyer House Hotel. Well, now, on Thursday evening, July 10th, by Omaha train, the Bay City Baseball Club arrived in the city and put up at the Sawyer House. That quiet and respectable stopping place does not, does but seldom harbor such a gang of rough, foul mouth and drunken characters as some of the members of the Bay City Club have proved themselves to be. Mr. Lowell, who is the proprietor, tried by every means in his power to keep them quiet, but it was no use. The place at last had to be called and Jerry Turbity, Turbity and one of the club was taken into the caboose and yesterday morning appeared before Judge Netherway. One or two others should have kept him company. <laughs> They're having to play a 12 inning game with St. Paul appears to have demoralized them. However, their conduct on Thursday night was anything but that of gentlemen. They will find out that there's a law abiding citizens here and that the police do their duty. It was really, and then the Stillwater Gazette also noted that when it comes to running a town, the boys, the Bay City boys, had better let Stillwater alone. Mm -hmm. So Jerry Turnbitty, what I have up here is the police roster. And there he is, right on top. He was resisting arrest. Well, I guess I would too. He, you know, he spent the night in the jail, in jail and he paid a $7.50 fine in the morning and then played the game in the afternoon. By the way, Jerry, uh, later in 1884, would play for the Kansas City Cowboys of the Union League, a major league. Hmm. Well, all the fun and good, lots of things to talk about. Fowler is amongst uh, the players. He's batting well, but July, kind of the beginning of the end. Stillwater tried to stay competitive. They're moving players like chess pieces. And at one time, they only had nine men on the roster. 
The pickup of John F. Quinn from Saginaw helped. This meant that Stillwater had two players named John Quinn. <laughs> Try to look at the box scores with that one. But even though that the, the team and the directors, remember all those things I said in the beginning about the directors running the team, the team itself was still making inroads in the, into the community. Uh, the St. Paul Daily Globe and the Stillwater News of July 19th had, a, had this little note. Baseball appears to have taken hold of the youth of the city. As in going through the city, wherever there's an available spot, you will find them at play. So the kids were really inspired by these, this team. In, uh, on July 22nd, Stillwater played Terre Haute. And Terre Haute only, only had eight players. So they loaned them Yarnell, who played center fielder and pitched for them. Stillwater won that game 14 to four. And Fowler, who was you know, basically batting against his teammate, went three for four scoring twice. But July 25th, the dominoes started to fall. Bay City Club, you know those foul mouth people who started all this? The Bay City Baseball Club on July 25th folded. They disbanded. The they were replaced from a club uh, by, they were replaced uh, by a club from Evansville, Indiana. On July 26th, Bradley all of a sudden reappears. He was, he was re-signed re and Fowler was to catch him, but refused. He just did not want to catch Bradley for some reason. So Fowler was fined and suspended for 30 days. The club behind Bradley defeated Grand Rapids that day, 11 to six. The following game, Bradley pitched again and lost 10 to nothing and to Grand Rapids. In that game, however, J.F. Quinn, who was recently signed from the Saginaws, and he had played, for, he had pitched for Stillwater. He had a pitching record of five and one for Stillwater. So, as I mentioned before, they would pitch like this. Don't worry, I'm not going to problem. <laughs> they pitch like this and put a lot of pressure on his arm. And in that game, in the first inning, they heard a loud snap, and then Quinn agonizing falls to the ground. He broke his arm while pitching. And then Bradley took over for him and lost 10 to nothing. Right after that game, Bradley was released again. And the next game, Fowler plays again. His 30 days suspension, uh, don't do it. it's only two games. <laughs> that was a fast one. It was a fast one. So you kind of can see, you know, Fowler, was a good player, but I also can imagine that Fowler didn't command a big salary. If he was one of the original players that I had up here and he had that thousand or twelve hundred dollar salary, he would have been gone. But his salary was smaller, so I'm sure that he that is what helped keep him there. And the Stillwater Messenger Messenger also on July 26th. Here's a little note for you. There is little reason to hope that Stillwater will have a professional team next year. Our citizens take but little interest in the entertainments which other cities draw large, large audiences. Here, the receipts from exhibitions run 25 to $100, while in St. Paul and Minneapolis, the receipts are from 150 to $600. As the cost of the home club to each game played on its own grounds is at least $100, in addition to salaries, it is evident that such amusement will not be furnished any longer than required to complete existing contracts. So that didn't sound too good. They had another road trip to go on. So the, uh, the team went off to Milwaukee to play two games on August 2nd and August 4th. Stillwater, they tried to play hard. They always tried to play hard, but it wasn't enough. They lost August 2nd to Milwaukee five to one. And August 4th, they lost 10 to two. That, left, that August 4th game was interesting because Fowler played shortstop for the first time during the season. He never played shortstop before except for that one game. And then he pitched the final two innings. So Fowler pitched the final two innings of the August 4th game. That was the last game. The games in Milwaukee were the last from Stillwater. And as I mentioned, Fowler threw the last pitch for the team. Also that day, the Fort Wayne Club disbanded, and later that same week, Peoria disbanded. 
uh, according to uh, the newspapers, which what we can have, the meeting of the stockholders of the Stillwater Club was held on Saturday, August 2nd, when the financial condition was, of the club was made known, it was decided to disband the team. It was importantly done on Tuesday and the players were paid off by A.A. A. Harper, who was sent to Milwaukee for that purpose. There were many who desired to have the club continue the season, but a larger number were opposed. Hmm, okay. And the club seemed to seem an expensive luxury. They had a pretty good argument in favor of disbanding. And when the meeting was called upon, only two voted against disbanding. There have been considerable fault, fault found with the management, no doubt. They have made mistakes, but it's not easy matter to manipulate a baseball club, especially to make financial success of the undertaking when audiences do not average more than 300 people. Okay, so now we get a picture of how many people were actually coming to the games, less than 300. But now I get now I start getting mad because the sporting life. Who remember this national newspaper called Stillwater a plucky little town for raising ten thousand three hundred dollars. Now says this club Stillwater should never have been admitted to the league. The, <laughs> the one horse character of the village can best be gleaned from the fact that it was not able to sustain a daily newspaper. All right. <laughs> I'm a little mad. Let's get this out. Let me let me tell you how it was. These people are sporting life. They're out on the East Coast. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Stillwater in, in January of 1884 had the weekly Stillwater Gazette, the weekly Stillwater Messenger, and the daily the Stillwater Daily Sun. However, the Gazette, which I have right here, in 1883, from May 5th, where is it? From May 15th to December 31st, was a daily. They stopped being a daily starting January of 1884. Then, when the Stillwater Daily Sun folded, when they went out of business, why did they go out of business? Well, a couple of reasons. One, the owner, whose name was Willett, who liked uh, to gamble. <laughs> He kind of lost a lot of money, so he had to close down his newspaper. And two, who picked up the newspaper? The Stillwater Gazette bought it. And in August, on August 25th, 1884, the Stillwater Gazette went daily and was daily for, another, for the next 125 years. So I get a little mad. I know, I know. So what? Uh, so the Stillwater Club, uh, five members of the Stillwater Baseball Club arrived back in Stillwater from Milwaukee. Those five players were Dealey, Fowler, Yarnell, Visner, and Jay Quinn. The boys took the disbanding quietly, they said. They did not wonder from, at, at it from the play that was being made. So only five of the team came back to Stillwater, including Fowler. So what was Fowler gonna do? How long was he gonna stay? Where was he gonna go? According to the uh, Stillwater Messenger, Dealey, the expert gentlemanly catcher for the late Stillwater Baseball Club, has been engaged by the Saint by St. Paul and is doing excellent work. All the boys have departed except for Fowler and Quinn. Well, Stillwater finished the finished their season 22 and 44. Near the bottom of the standings, they were not the worst. Fowler played in 51 games, batted 298 with seven wins and eight losses as a pitcher the most wins by any pitcher on the team. So, and he had the best batting record as well. But what's next? The Northwestern League suffered with the loss of the Stillwater Club and Fort Wayne and Bay City, and they tried to reorganize. But two weeks later, the, the Northwestern League was down from 12 teams down to four teams. They had Milwaukee, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and they included the Winona Club. Hmm. So soon after that, they played about a, a handful of games and the entire Northwestern League folded. Some of the teams, one or two, was it Milwaukee and St. Paul, ended up in the Union League. Remember, the Union League was a third national, major league that year. And um, If you want to know more about the St. Paul's and the Union League, there's a nice article written uh, by Stu Dorland. Still have that, by the way. 
So the players scattered, most found other careers. The manager, according to the Stillwater Gazette of August 20th, the managers for the Keokuk Club had written for Fowler and Visner to play the rest of the season down in Keokuk, Iowa. Hmm. When Joe Miller played for Keokuk. Not that I say that Joe Miller had anything to do with it, more than likely uh, Johnny Peters had more to do with it, but Peters didn't come back to Stillwater, Stillwater after Milwaukee. So Fowler ended up leaving Stillwater, going down to Keokuk where he played in 1885. How good was the Stillwater team? All these players that played for the Stillwater team at one time or another, had major league experience, either before or after going. Edward Brown, Joseph Connor, Fred Corey, Peter Fries, Frank Graves, Pat Dealey, Fred Gunkel. Remember, Gunkel played one game in Cleveland, <laughs> which is one more than I've ever done. Frank Jones actually left the team in midseason and, play, and played for Detroit. Johnny Peters had 11 years experience. John Pickett, three years. Otto Schomburg, three years. Joseph Visner. Look at he played for Baltimore, Brooklyn, Pittsburgh, Washington, and St. Louis. Stillwater had a lot of good players. And in, in my opinion, and I know it's maybe my love for Stillwater and this team, but I think if it could have hung on for another week, maybe two, they might have found themselves in the Union League as well. That would have made Fowler that year the third Black Major League player. Yes, I know, I have high hopes. <laughs> Fowler's career after Stillwater. Fowler was a baseball nomad. He uh, left Stillwater, played in Keokuk in 1885. He also played, but he played uh, not with Visner, but in Keokuk, he played with Otto Schomburg. So obviously this is Fowler. This is Otto Schomburg who played for Stillwater. But when Keokuk folded, uh, he moved on to play in uh, Pueblo, Pueblo, Colorado later that year. In 1886, he played in Topeka, Kansas. 18, 80, 1887, he played in Binghamton, New York. He batted 350. He also played in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Greenville, Galesburg, Illinois, Terre Haute, Terre Haute, Indiana, Findlay, Ohio, Lincoln, Nebraska, Kearney, Nebraska, Adrian, Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. But if you look at some of those was teams that he played for later on. He played for a lot of Michigan teams. But in 1884, he played in a lot of Michigan towns, four of them. And he actually played for Terre Haute when he played against Terre Haute in, from Stillwater. So again, 1884 was Fowler's coming out. He was a, he, he got his national uh, vision. People uh, saw him for the first time. But after the color line started dropping and it dropped and it dropped and Fowler stayed on and played in, on white teams as long as he could, but he uh, knew it was coming. So he organized a lot of black barnstorming baseball teams. He organized uh, the Cuban Giants, Smoky City Giants, all American black tourists, Kansas City Stars, but he's most well known for organizing the Page Finch Giants out in Adrian, Michigan. They, the Page Finch Giants, they were a barnstorming team. They had their own rail car and they would go off and play all over the place. It was Fowler's dream to start a Negro Leagues. And he tried back in, 18, in 1904 and 1905, but he just did not get the financial backing. Uh, I guess this quote from The Sporting Life in December of 1885 really kind of sums up Bud Fowler. It says, Fowler, the crack colored second baseman is still in Denver, Colorado, disengaged. The poor fellow's skin is against him. With his splendid abilities, he would have long ago have been some, on some good club had his color been white instead of black. Those who know say there's no better second baseman in the country. He is beside a good batter and a fine base runner. They, at that time, recognized his ability, but they also recognized he is not going to go anywhere. He's black. Yeah. They recognized that that division there. Uh, L. Robert Davids wrote of uh, Fowler. He was, Fowler was not, a doc, was not docile when threatened and had several confrontations with other players and management in the course of his career, which we saw in Stillwater when he went against uh, catching Bradley. 
in the book, History of Colored Baseball, written by Saul White, who played with Fowler on the page bench Giants in, 19, in his book in 1907, he describes Fowler as the celebrated promoter of colored baseball clubs and the sage of baseball. Bud Fowler's final years. After Fowler start, after he attempted to start the Negro Leagues failed, he faded away into almost into obscurity. He became ill and moved in with his sister in Frankfurt, New York, and died on February 26, 1913, at the age of almost 55. So we have his uh, obituary, his uh, death certificate, and this is a picture of Bud Fowler that was published in the newspaper back in 1908. In 19, Fowler was buried in a pauper's grave, unmarked. In July 1987, the Society of American Baseball Researchers, Sabre, placed a headstone at the unmarked grave of Bud Fowler in Oakview Cemetery in Frankfurt, New York. Yes, that is me. <laughs> yeah. So, one of my, one of the things I want to do, and my wife is, I'm sure, scared to hear this, but uh, Mr. Thornley has been to every Hall of Fame player's gravesite. And I would like to go to every gravesite of the Stillwater team. So I got one. By the way, I've got a, I got a route that when we go out there, uh, we're going to go past a couple of so. <laughs> so the early baseball committee of the Baseball Hall of Fame had considered uh, Bud Fowler to be enshrined and he was elected with these other players and David Ortiz is not in there this is before this so Bud Fowler goes in Gil Hodges Jim Cott, Minnie Minoso, Buck O'Neill, Tony Oliva, and David Ortiz goes in, they go into the Hall of Fame. So Fowler, who grew up in Cooperstown, is now going to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. I just think that's July 24th, 2022 is when he's doing the uh, induction ceremony, and my wife Chris and I will be there. We have our Give our reservations at the Rose and Thistle bed breakfast. <laughs> Fowler uh, would not have been the most, uh, he probably would not have been one of the most important early black baseball players in history without playing in Stillwater. His national exposure from his days in Stillwater catapulted him to what he did later on. He had a lot, he, along with other black players, could really play the game. And what and that is what he and will be long remembered for. One of the things I also came up with, I know it's kind of it's a small sample. So Bob, don't get mad at me. It's a small sample. But how good was Fowler? How good would he be against major league pitching? If you got to go into the major leagues at that time, how good would he be? Well, I got a small, like I said. Uh, there was a, a pitcher named John Clarkson who pitched for Saginaw. John Clarkson ended up with 328 major league wins, and he was enshrined in the Hall of Fame in 1963. So Fowler went five for 16 with one run scored. So he batted 313 against Clarkson. There was also a, a pitcher from the Minneapolis club named Bob Carruthers. Now, Bob Carruthers went to the major leagues and he won 218 games and only lost 99. Fowler faced him only twice, 10 at bats and four hits, batting 400. It was kind of interesting though, when I, I list, uh, talk about Carruthers, there's a book, uh, Jeffrey Michael Lang, this on Bud Fowler. And uh, he talked in here, they talk about, uh, when uh, the color line was really being dropped and uh, the St. Louis owner, Vander Law, I think Vander Law is how you pronounce it. There was an 1889, several players did not want to play against black uh, players. Vander had arranged a 
a game against them, against the Bar Army Black team. And they had a petition and they did not want to play against them and would not. And on that petition, Bob Crothers signed it. So that was kind of interesting there. Now I have gone on forever, <laughs> more than I wanted to, but this is the team that really pushed me into the history field. Now I wouldn't say that Professor, Professor Comiglio was a mentor of mine. He was just that kind of that push that pushed me into this direction other than other directions I could have went. And I've been fortunate. This has given me so much uh, joy and it really has given me a lot of, for my career going after the 1884 team and Bud Fowler. I've been able to meet a lot of great people, talk to a lot of great people. And as I mentioned, Stu Thornton, I have letters here from Bob Focus. Stu Thornley, you didn't, by the way, Stu, you didn't, you didn't date this letter. <laughs> but uh, Bill Dean from the uh, Hall of Fame, back in the 80s when he was in charge of research. So I, I have a whole box of prior to the internet, you wrote to libraries to get uh, <laughs> microfilm printed. I have a file of every team player there, is, there was. And uh, I have from the Sporting Life, every box score in the Sporting Life, which by the way, did not have all the box scores for the Stillwater team. So that is why I'm mad at that as well. <laughs> if you look online, you'll see uh, Fowler's uh, stats from Stillwater. They always say he played 48 games. No, he played 51. <laughs> and I have the box scores and I've got them right here if you want to see that. 19th century stars, Fowler's in there. Muskegon baseball, I've got that. If you want uh, good books about black baseball, here's one we have for sale. They play for the love of the game by Frank White. We have these for sale here, don't we, Emily? We do. <laughs> Early black baseball in Minnesota by Tim Peterson. Uh, uh, Todd, my brother's name is Todd, so we just have a Tim. <laughs> and then uh, Swinging for the Fences. There's an article in here by Dan Kegley about Fowler and the Stillwater team. There's only one thing I've ever found from the Northwestern League uh, from 1884. I was one time early on with eBay, and I'm sorry, Chris, <laughs> but I found this little scorebook. It is from, a, from Fort Wayne, it's a cigar department and their baseball headquarters. But in there, they have the schedule of all the teams, Grand Rapids, and some of them are filled in, even with the Stillwater. So this is the only thing I have found. I've also found it was either in the Daily Sun or in the Gazette that there was a photo taken of the Stillwater team. And you can come down to this shop and buy your photo of the team. I've never seen one. So if you ever see the team photo, now you know what the uh, uniforms look like, so you can identify it. We would love to have a, a team, uh, team photo. So again, thank you for coming. I know this is uh, kind of uh, went more than my time, but uh, this is uh, what I really like to do. Do you have any questions? Yeah, Chris, again, I have a plaque at the location of the field. Excuse me? I again, have a plaque. Okay, I think we should. Right now, the, the where the baseball stadium is, I don't think it's configured the same way it was back in 1884, but they're still playing baseball on that. And it's owned by the Stillwater uh, School District. So I've been talking with the uh, superintendent and their offices are directly across the street from us, Melinda. And uh, Melinda wants, says she wants to do it, but she has to check it. Now they, of course, they came back is who's going to pay for it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to be liable for it? I go, oh my God, people. So <laughs> I have talked to the mayor, Ted uh, Kozlowski, I don't know. Yeah, whatever his name is. It's Mayor Ted. <laughs> mayor Ted wants to put up something there. Well, the city owns a 10-foot easement all the way around that place. So if they can put something up, it'll be close to the road. And uh, also, but thought it would be great to have that because Adrian Michigan has uh, a plaque. Uh, Lynn, Massachusetts has a plaque. 
on Double Day Field, they have a plaque and they have named a road Fowler Way in Cooperstown. Bob was there when they unveiled it. It's still unveiled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't see it when it was veiled. But I think I think it should uh, we should do something. And there's also another bud who played on the field. You know who the other bud was? Grant. <laughs> yeah, this is the crowd, right? So Bud Grant, Harry Bud Grant, who's the Hall of Famer in the Football Hall of Fame, played for the Stillwater Loggers in 54 and 55. And so he played there as well. Stu. Well, first of all, talk to me. There's a new Sabre Landmarks Committee that started this week in one of the Oh, okay. Trust. So that's good timing. I understand the other the city because I work for the State Health Department. Oh, nice. That is the site of the pillbox downtown St. Paul Ballpark. Mm -hmm. St. Paul Gophers played the Leland Giants. And I think going through government is tougher than the private business. So, oh, school uh, district commission can help. Um, <laughs> Bradley, well, Bob Davis, you referred to his article. I think Bob Davis got into that. And Tony Molina maybe had the same problem, but didn't want to pitch for a black catcher. Was that part of the deal with Bradley and Fowler and that he wouldn't accept Fowler's fine to cross him up? See, pitches? I would love to know that. All I know is what I've been able to read in the newspaper. And that was, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that's exactly what happened. Or. Bradley thought Fowler was inconsistent or you know, blacks couldn't catch or I mean, I'm sure Bradley had something against Fowler and it had to do with his race. But nobody else seemed to have a problem with Fowler catching them or catching Fowler themselves when he pitched. So it had to be something. I would like to know more. And I tried to find more information about Bradley, but I think that was a made up name. I mean, there's just nothing on MJ Bradley. After he shows up in box scores with Winona, he played with Winona, uh, but he doesn't show up anywhere else. He's a ghost. And uh, I don't know, I wish I knew, but I would imagine that would be the case. There was another thing that, uh, oh, again, I have all these books out here and I'm sorry about that. But a lot of the people who write the books and they talk about Stillwater for Bud Fowler, they just, cruise over Stillwater. And they don't really get deep down. Like when Bob, when you did your article, you, you went into Stillwater. You didn't just fly over it. And uh, in this book, it talks about, this Jeffrey talks about that same incident and said, uh, he was like, uh, he missed three games due to pitch that hit him in ribs and was fined $50 and suspended for two weeks, reduced to two days for refusing to catch a newly signed pitcher, Bradley. Now Bradley was newly signed, but he was newly re-signed because he had played earlier in the year with Stillwater, who it, it was reported would not take signals from colored man. Maybe. The difficulty between Fowler and Bradley may have been more than racially motivated. Bradley was replacing Fowler as the team's number one hurler. There is no chance. <laughs> and uh, there may have been some distrust on both players' part about how committed, how committed each other was to the team. Well, Bradley was released once and he was released just a couple of days later. So there was no chance Bradley was gonna be number one pitcher, even if he thought so. But this guy did not know that Bradley was part of the team earlier on and Fowler had actually caught him in an earlier game, so. Uh, Brent, uh, the picture of Piacock, uh, Fowler looks like a fairly small man. Do you have a height and weight for him? Oh, it's online. It's, he was about five foot eight, I think, about a hundred and nothing, 135, 140 yeah. pounds. Because he he did a lot of he did a lot of base stealing. And unfortunately for the 1884 season, the official records were put in a in a warehouse and the warehouse burned down. I would have liked to know how many bases Fowler stole because there, when you get when you get an actual description of the entire game, Fowler's in there stealing bases. And I think the funny work that was mentioned by the Gazette and the Stillwater home opener was because Fowler stole went from first to second and he was going to go to third and got caught in the hot box basically that was taken out. 
So Fowler was aggressive on the base with his base running. I'd like to know more about that. A lot of sources say he was 5'7 and 155. Okay. 5'8, five, 5'7. Five, I consider myself 5'10. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where in Stillwater the barber shop was? Yes, it was on Main Street. Unfortunately, uh, it says 113 North Main Street, but the uh, numbers changed in 1888. So I'm not exactly sure which building that is, but it's, I think it's still standing. He did play at the athletic field. Oh, yes. But, yes. That, but the um, thing pays the other way then? Well, what I, what I, what I read yeah. back about the uh, stadium and said baseball grounds, this is what gets me kind of confused. It's seat some 500. The whole grounds are. The grandstand was going to be at the south side. So I'm not sure if that's the south side they mean. Is that along Orleans? Or where is that exactly? It doesn't make, but I've been I've been doing more uh, research on the stadium itself. And I got uh, I was Google uh, on the uh, St. Paul Pine uh, St. Paul Daily Globe site uh, from Chronicling America. And uh, I emailed Bob. Because they came up with, they had a, they had the stadium, and so in 1885 they were trying to play ball in it. And they came up with the Young Ladies Baseball Club, the World Champion Women's Baseball Team, and it, oh, it is just a hoot and a half because the Globe talks about the whole game. He said uh, the stands were full. There was 1,200 people, 12 to 1,300 people there. So. You knew that baseball park could hold that many people. So, and uh, of the uh, of the ladies, they described there was there were two to three uh, cute girls, three to four homely ones, and uh, two or three that you wouldn't want to see at night. Oh. This was in 1885. Describing the women in the newspaper. <laughs> So I appreciate everyone coming tonight, and I know I missed a lot of things. Uh, there's going to be part two, three, and four, but uh, <laughs> I also want to thank the Minnesota Twins uh, while I have a chance because they gave us some money to do our little black, our black and baseball exhibit that's around the corner here, and uh, the Twins have been very helpful, and they also, Clyde Debner, uh, loaned us a couple of jerseys. One is a uh, St. Paul colored gophers jersey that one of the twins wore during a black thing down in Kansas City and another one was a uh, number 42 that they wear on uh, April 15th or someday in April to, uh, that everybody in the major leagues wears number 42 for Jackie Robinson. So, so. Well thank you very much. I don't want to keep you any longer. Take some cracker jacks and uh, water, which is donated to us by It's Just Water. And we have, uh, uh, they play for the love of the game uh, for sale. And all of that fun stuff. Thanks for taking care of my balls. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>